Of all of Cotton's war buddies, he only had one right-hand man, and that man's name was Topsy. Topsy? Yeah. Remember that thing we said we were going to do but never did? No, 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 we did that. We did the hell out of that. I mean, that other thing. I think it's time we finally completed our mission. Hey folks, welcome to Squirrel Tactics. Like, subscribe, check out the Patreon, let's do this. Sergeant Topsy Topping 10. Don't know his real first name, could possibly be Topsy, could possibly be something like, I don't know, Bernard. Voiced by the ever versatile Steven Root, who also voiced Bill, among others. And to go ahead and get this out of the way, it is possible that Topsy is named after the elephant that was executed by electrocution at Coney Island in 1903. And no, unlike what Bob's Burgers would have you believe, they say... Thomas Edison, he's the man to get us into this century. And that man is me. Thomas Edison had nothing to do with it other than one of the press crews there to record the event was from Edison Studios. Now, I made a video about the whole thing. I'll put a link in the description. But basically, yeah, an elephant named Topsy was publicly executed by electrocution. And if you're surprised that they'd electrocute an elephant, I also made a video about the elephant that was hanged. Yes, hanged. And if you're wondering how the chains used to hang an elephant didn't break, they did the first time. And just so we're clear here, I'm not saying that Thomas Edison Edison wasn't a piece of crap. He was. He screwed over a lot of people. Truth be told, he wasn't an inventor so much as he was a businessman. Anywho, Topsy may have served with Cotton in the Pacific Theater of World War II. We see Cotton refer to them raising hell being like old times. Outstanding work, Sergeant. Reminds me of the old days. All right, who's next? Who's next? <laughs> but it's possible that they met after the war, both being members of the local VFW as World War II veterans. But who knows? Cotton does mention this from Topsy's War Days. That's it. You shouldn't be waiting for a bus. You strangled Herman Gary for God's sake. But it could have just been a story that Topsy told Cotton about rather than Cotton actually being there, especially since in Cotton's plot, it's revealed that Cotton fought in the Pacific and was not in Munich. Hell, he probably was never even in Germany. In deference to the committee's busy schedule, I have chosen to highlight only a few of Cotton Hill's many acts of bravery at Guam, the Solomon Islands, Sardinia, and Okinawa. Dang it, woman, you forgot Munich. You were never in Munich. I wasn't? No. We know that after the war, Topsy basically served as Cotton's right-hand man. We see him aiding Cotton in his attempt to assassinate Fidel Castro at Yankee Stadium in 1957 in Yankee Hanky. Have a cigar, you weak chin Cuban son of a bitch! There, go. Yeah, that was how Hank ended up being born in a Yankee Stadium bathroom. Not now, woman! I'll hold it in! Go, go, go! You're running for two, woman! Oh, let's go, let's go, let's go! Oh. We learn in As Old as the Hills that Topsy used to babysit Hank when he was a kid. Bobby, get in here! Bobby, this is Topsy! Topsy babysat your daddy when he was a boy! And he's gonna babysit your uncle, too! I need the money. You're the au pair they were talking about? We also see that Topsy may or may not have had all his teeth pulled, and he may or may not be legally blind. Come here, son. Go ahead and get a good look at you. Mm. Go on, Bobby. Let Topsy get a look at you. Okay. I'm not gonna bite you. He can't. Had all his teeth yanked out of his head because they was green. And yet, a little closer. My eyes ain't as good as they used to be. Topsy's legally blind! By the way, I don't think he's actually blind since we see him driving in a later episode, but we'll get to that. What Topsy is mostly known for is his lung capacity and, for lack of a better term, blowing ability. Get your mind out the gutter. He's kind of like a human puffer fish. His go-to is to balloon out his cheeks, which tends to terrify those that witness it. Though it often works in his favor, sometimes it does end up working against him. Where's my wife? Hello? I'll do something, Topsy! 
Oh, 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 do something else. He was with Cotton at the Bottomless Pit, which apparently is a strip club in Houston that he and Cotton frequent quite a bit, when Dee Dee went into labor, but luckily it's on the speed dial a few times, and notice the only other speed dial programmed is Topsy. It means the baby's almost done. Now? Soon. You have to phone Cotton. I don't know the number for the Bottomless Pit. It's number one on the speed dial. And number three. Fun fact, so there actually is a bottomless pit in Houston. They're currently celebrating their 50th year. But rather than a strip club, it's a barbecue place. I've never had it, but from what I hear, it's pretty daggum good. In the fictional version of the bottomless pit, we do get to see Topsy playing an interesting game of ping pong. Bobby, this better be good. The next gala plays ping pong without a paddle. Dee Dee's gonna have the baby. We'll meet you at the hospital. But Dee Dee can't draw it. We to call them... Come on, Topsy! Let's roll! Yeah, we know where that ball's been. Also, how can anyone forget him and Cotton during the credits to Moving On Up, where they're called Nazis and they do not take it well? Now this place looks terrible! You ain't Pops! Oh, that old guy, yeah, he died. Dead? Then I'm arresting you for suspicion of murder! Grab him, Topsy! No, I'm not all right, boy. Just come along. Hey, get your hands off me, you Nazi! Who are you calling a Nazi? No! All right, Topsy, uh, let's roll. Yeah, it's quite possible they just killed that guy, but you know, that cotton headbutt is way overpowered. Where is he as a Mortal Kombat character? Anywho, we next see him playing poker against Cotton and the other VFW guys, and when Cotton comes marching home, where Peggy drops by to try and borrow Cotton's war medals. Come on, Topsy, is it in or is it out? Dims is your rich pot, Dims is your knife hold. Yoo-hoo, Dad! Entertainment's here! Take off your top! <laughs> oh, it takes why. See, Peggy's plan was to ask Cotton to borrow his medals to use on her float for the Veterans Day Parade in order to add authenticity to it, considering the long history of love and cooperation between the two. What do you want? I'm up eight cents. Well, I noticed your authentic war medals in the lobby display. All right. You want my medals. Okay, I'll give them to you. Cost you two hundred dollars a day. There's only one way you could make that. Except you're twenty years too old and twenty pounds too skinny. And yeah, it didn't work, because of course it didn't work. Cotton can't stand Hank's wife. Hell, she's only allowed in his car if she's in a bag in the trunk. Under no circumstances is the wife allowed in my Cadillac car. Unless she's in a bag in the trunk. I know, I know. So, no, he's not going to hand those over, but we do get a great cotton moment. <laughs> cotton Hill, I do not know what I hate more about you. The way you talk to me or the way you treat your wife and your little child. Well, think about it. We see Topsy as Cotton's right-hand man quite a bit in this episode, including when Hank comes by and offers to help out Cotton financially, and Topsy is summoned to usher Hank out. Look, Dad, I've got a few extra dollars in my passbook account. I could help you out. You ain't my daddy. I'm your daddy. Topsy! No, 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 no. Show Hank at the door. <laughs> All right, back off. God. Eventually, after he's forced to work as a bathroom attendant rather than getting to march in the Veterans Day Parade, which, yeah, that is pretty messed up, Cotton snaps and starts to go on a rampage. Rampage! No, a little bit different kind of rampage. I ain't no stinkhouse porter. You think a shinless man can't remove asbestos? I'll show you what a 75-year-old shinless man can remove. Told you it was a rug. And, of course, Cotton can't go on a proper rampage without his right-hand man Topsy at his side. Please don't kill me. Oh, I won't. But in a few minutes, you was gonna wish you was dead. <laughs> Take your time, sir. Yeah, thanks. However, Cotton comes to his senses, seeing that he's accomplished nothing in his revenge spree, and though Topsy tries to be a true hype man and keep him going, the rampage, like the world according to T.S. Eliot, whimpers to an end. There's nobody left. 
and I still ain't done nothing to help my family. <laughs> Come on, Colonel. This is the way you say, jump the let's roll, and you say. Sorry, Tappington. Some things a man has to do on his own. In Yankee Hanky, Topsy is part of the plot to kill Castro. Yeah, again, they hadn't forgotten about their mission. And we see him discussing the plan at the VFW with Cotton's other war buddies. And at midnight, we rendezvous in San Antonio with one Jorge Lopez. As you know, he's half Mexican, half Cuban. For this job, we'll be using a half that's Cuban. How are we going to get to San Antonio? We can't all fit in your Cadillac car. I guess I could take a few people in my Cadillac car, but I don't want to. By the way, this would probably be a good time to go ahead and talk about Cotton's other war buddies, who are mostly named either Fatty, Stinky, or Brooklyn, with a dock peppered in there. Had to get you out of that house. Nothing there but girls and babies. I'm referring to your husband. That's why I brought you here. Meet the greatest collection of soldiers this country has ever known. Stinky, Fatty, Stinky, Brooklyn, Stinky, Brooklyn, Fatty, Fatty, and Doc. Oh, and Erwin Linker. Yeah, and Erwin Linker, who apparently has a foul mouth. He is making his wife and your little brother stay in that tiny room just so he can play cards all day with that foul mouth Erwin Linker. And he isn't the best driver out there either. Remember how the cops tracked you down when you hit that fire hydrant? We're hitting more than a fire hydrant this time! Though he is not afraid to object and challenge a word Scrabble, it might just be because he's an ornery old man, which may or may not lead to Cotton telling a war story that may or may not be true. Anzio. You can't use that. I challenge. What? Challenge? The Battle of Anzio, 30th day of January 1944. We cut the crowds with their pants down and their schnitzel exposed. We take the beach by noon, the town by nightfall. I can still taste the Chianti out of that senora's navel. Oh, and apparently he's also dead this entire time, seeing as it's shown in a later episode we're going to get to later that he died in 1991. So maybe this was Erwin Linker's ghost the entire time. But if nothing else good comes from Cotton's war buddies, at least the Brooklyns have something good going for them. Well, it's not all bad. G.H. is too young to understand cuss words, and the Brooklyns are very good with him. I've seen it. Anywho, Hank comes by during the planning session, angry that he's a native New Yorker, and yeah, watch Topsy here. And I can't drive my truck, and I tried a bagel, and I actually liked it. His truck. No, no more lies. I loved that bagel. Go to hell. You know, part of me legit wonders if Topsy could have strangled Hank here or if Hank would have fought out of it. Does it really matter because Hank became part of the plan to kill Castro, mostly as a patsy? Come on, Hank. All I'm asking for is a second chance. Ugh. Well, a real Texas man's night out. That's just what I needed, I tell you what. So after getting Hank's fingerprints on the prospective murder weapon... I'm having a ball. Oh, that's nice. Now give me the gun. Then having Hank put the equipment needed for the operation on his card before getting him drunk and looky there, Topsy's driving in at night. I'd just like to tell Buck Strickland to kiss off. Yellamo! Plus, he can read the signs, so I think he can see better than we've been led on to believe. They're able to trick a drunk Hank into letting them tie his hands together, and they overpower him enough to strip him down to his boxers and toss him over the fence of the Alamo. 41 years old, and I didn't see it coming. I've got to hide my nudity. And yeah, I have to include this because it's just awesome. <sighs> Sorry about this, Mr. Crockett. Why am I wearing the hat? Hank shows up to the dock in time to stop the guy from heading to Cuba, though they do put up a fight with Topsy doing his part. You don't have what it takes to stop me. Do it, Topsy! <laughs> <sighs> Uh, old guy breath. Uh and after Hank stays underwater for much longer than he should, we get another reminder of Topsy's legendary lung capacity. You know, Colonel, your boy should have come up by now. 
Even Topsy can't hold his breath that long. What? Ah, oh, all right. Stinky, you better get him. Where is he? Where is he? Don't, don't shoot him! Jump in and save him! Luckily for Hank, he used Erwin Linker's oxygen tank to stay underwater and disabled the boat's engine, finally leading to the men admitting that they're too old to complete their mission, even Cotton. Oh, I just wanted to kill Castro. I know, Dad. I know. The next time we see Topsy is in Fortunate Son, where the Arlen VFW is having money issues, mostly due to the fact that the veterans are getting old and dying, so they hold a fundraiser to, well, raise funds. And I'm pretty sure that this is Topsy in the Dunk of Veteran Tank. Aunt Peggy, I don't think this is right. He's a very old man. Luann, this is for charity. Uh. Oh, yeah! The only other guy it could be was Erwin Linker, but there's no oxygen tanker mask there, so yeah, I think it's Topsy that Peggy Hill keeps dunking even though he's clearly having a difficult time and is shivering. Let's go. But I paid for another throw. The sale ends up going badly when Cotton gets angry at Eustace, who is buying Hitler's canoe, because of Eustace's vehicle choice. Yeah, it's the maroon Mitsubishi. Mitsubishi? They made the planes that bombed Pearl Harbor! Now, I totally get this. My grandpa fought in the Pacific during the Second World War, and he hated Mitsubishi for the rest of his life. He straight up refused to have anything to do with the brand. Unfortunately, they failed to raise enough money to save the VFW, and it ends up shutting down, with the guys setting up shop on the front lawn, staring at a television that isn't even plugged in. Oh, Dad, you guys deserve better than this. Yeah, damn straight we do. Bring us a heat lamp. And some sandwiches. I'm so... God dang hungry. Hank decides to bring them home with him so they have somewhere to go, and notice Topsy here when Peggy drives by, and he takes his hat off like an old school gentleman. Dance through my life. Hey Peggy, guess what? The idea is brought up to Cotton and Topsy that they could save the VFW if they brought in veterans from the Vietnam War, which Cotton is not much of a fan of. Vietnam boys? No gat dang way! The VFW stands for Veterans of Foreign Wars, not briefer smoking losers! However, he decides to give them a chance, and it's interesting what this episode does as it contrasts veterans from World War II and Vietnam. It really highlights how the two generations dealt with trauma. It's kind of like what the novel First Blood did with the Korean and Vietnam Wars. By the way, if you've seen the movie but never read the book, trust me, read the book. Then afterwards, start reading anything else by David Morrell that you can get your hands on. Anywho, Hank gets in touch with a local Vietnam vet support group and the two groups meet up for a picnic. Though, yeah, there is quite a difference between them with the Vietnam vets telling a touching story of losing his friend who ran after a picture of his girl and was killed, but then we get this. I spent four years away from my wife in dogfights with zeros over the Pacific. Those four years in my F-6 Hellcat were the only peace and quiet I ever got. <laughs> <laughs> also can't help but find it interesting that Topsy carries a bayonet with him. I wonder if he always has that on him. Anyone got a bottle opener? This dark on, sir. Hey, a bayonet. Toss that over here. Boy, this takes me back. He and Cotton decide to recreate the scene of how Topsy got that bayonet, including the sound that the man he killed made, which is more than a little much for the Vietnam vets. Topsy, remember that kamikaze you gutted back on Ewo? What did he say? <coughs> yeah! 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 Stop it! Stop it! You're freaking Ronnie out, man. Uh, maybe you should ease up a little, Dad. Luckily, they see that what they're doing is causing these guys who are in therapy to deal with their trauma, more trauma, and stop. Yeah, no, no, of course they keep doing it. Oh, come on, boy! This bothers you? How about this? Dying! Cut it out! 
This leads to the Vietnam vets freaking out, Cotton showing us another one of his ridiculously OP headbutts. Hey, easy there, big boy. And the Vietnam vets decide to hunt down Cotton and Hank. While they're doing so, we see this exchange from Topsy that kind of makes me feel bad for him. Dirty hippie. You know, you could benefit from a little group therapy. Clear up some of that anger. I haven't slept in 50 years. He's so tired. By the way, we know this isn't true because we already saw him sleeping. And that kind of sad moment where Topsy finally breaks down a little bit, it's actually the last time we see Topsy. Since the next time he's mentioned is in Dale Tech and he's been dead for six months. Your war buddies! Stinky, stanky, smelly! They've all been shoved into retirement homes. Got useless and got locked up. I'll accept Topsy. Topsy, perfect! You guys could hang out at his place, play checkers... At his place? He's playing checkers with worms. Died six months ago. And in Death Buys a Timeshare, we find out that Cotton was left some money to take care of Topsy's funeral. More on that here in a second. And he ends up spending the rest on a Mexican timeshare. Well, all the money I inherited from Topsy's estate got me to thinking. Topsy's dead. I outlived my last friend. Dang, it makes a man feel invincible. Topsy left me $10,000 to take care of his funeral. So after the cremation and ash bag, I'm still up 9920 Topsy was cremated, and his final resting place ended up being the same as Cotton's, which we see in Serves Me Right for giving General George S. Patton the bathroom key, meaning that his ashes were flushed down a toilet that General Patton supposedly used before before heading to Mexico to hunt down Pancho Villa. We see his name on the, for lack of a better term, grave marker when they add Cotton's, showing that Topsy died on June 5th, 2002, which doesn't quite add up with the six-month reference in Dell Tech, which came out in March of 2004, but eh, whatever, it's close enough. So, Topsy was an interesting feller. He's a World War II vet who clearly has unresolved issues and trauma. However, he is very much a man of his time in that they handled it in a much different way than say, Vietnam vets. He's also willing to do the dirty work. He took it upon himself to nearly garrote Hank before Cotton waved him off. He was right there with Cotton and a good amount of his hell raising, and he didn't need any prodding at all to be on board with killing Castro and potentially framing Hank for it. Topsy was a good soldier during the war and after, and we see his more old school mentality when he took off his hat in front of Peggy. Though note he didn't do it in a different episode when he thought that she might be a stripper. Yeah, I guess that kind of says something. Ultimately, they did a good job with Topsy. He's good for a laugh and is the perfect right hand for Cotton. He lived a long life, fought for his country, dealt with the resulting trauma, and then got flushed down a toilet. That sounds about right. They'll say, oh, Topsy at my, oh, Topsy, but no one will be more shocked than me.